Our second panelist is, is Melissa Inouye. Her topic today is how have the racial realities protected or restricted religious freedom in Latter-day Saint majority and communities? As a way of introduction of Melissa, Melissa, in a way, is a historian at the Church History Historical Department. Her areas of research include the history of modern China, charismatic global Christianity, and global history of the Latter-day Saints. She is the author of China and the True Jesus, Charisma and Organization in a Chinese Christian Church, published by the Oxford University Press, and a second publication, Crossing a Bald Asian American Latter-day Saint Woman, Scholars Ventures Through Life, Death, Cancer, and Motherhood, parenthetically, not necessarily in that order, published by Deseret Book. So good to be here. I'm so grateful for, um, for the wonderful invitation to present at this conference. Today, um, I'm, I'm working from a longer paper, so um, I'm going to just try to truncate on the spot. <coughs> Forgive my voice. I've got a drug-related uh, throat condition right now. So Joseph Smith characterized religious freedom as a privilege which Latter-day Saints claimed for themselves and advocated for others. This teaching was grounded not only in Smith's revelations and expansive views of theology and government, but also in the Latter-day Saints' experiences of prejudice and persecution as a marginalized religious group. My paper today argues that religious rights, privileges, and opportunities are predicated on civil rights, privileges, and opportunities including the rights, privileges, and opportunities of racial minorities in society. I will use Utah's Chinese as a case study. Today, I draw on Utah newspapers between 1850 and 1945, during which Latter-day Saints comprised well over two-thirds of the state's population, to show how racial attitudes and actions in Latter-day Saint-dominated communities influenced others' freedom to worship. To be clear, Utahns and Latter-day Saints are not the exact same groups of people. Newspapers, which had different owners and platforms, did not speak for the entire community. Nevertheless, because of the dominance of Latter-day Saints across Utah's government, media, and cultural institutions during this time, I think we can, from these sources, understand something about Latter-day Saint community values. I will focus on the experience of Chinese Utahns, who have been featured relatively little in um, existing scholarship, despite their long-standing presence in the state. Now, some might say religious freedom is not contingent on racial realities. Religious freedom is a freedom among many others. It's not predicated on any other freedom, but stands alongside all of them. In some societies, unfortunately, people might have lacked or might currently lack some freedoms like the right to own property or the right to marry on account of racial discrimination. But at least they have religious freedom. Therefore, the presence of racism in society, while unfortunate, has nothing to do with the presence or absence of religious freedom. Now, such a line of re reasoning only works if one holds that religious freedom is simply the right to believe in the sense of having ideas in one's head. In this case, anyone with a head has full religious freedom, and there's no point in us having this conference. But Joseph Smith said, we claim the privilege of worshiping, which in its immediate context referred to a collective activity. If religion includes practice, including personal and group devotions, public speech, institutional policies, temple building, dress codes, and so on, then religion clearly takes place in a social context. The social space available to a given individual determines whether their practice of religion is free or constrained. Members of marginalized groups that do not have access to the same range of social, cultural, or civic opportunities as members of that dominant group cannot possibly have access to the same range of religious opportunities. To the extent that a person's options and opportunities in society differ on the basis of race or any other immutable human characteristics, that is a society without full religious freedom. One example to illustrate the connection between racial privilege and religious privilege is the situation of Gobo Fango, a member of the Kosa tribe who was brought to Utah from South Africa by a Latter-day Saint family at the age of six. Gobo did farm labor at the bidding of the Talbot family. He could not worship in whatever sacred space he wanted or participate in any religious community on his own terms. He lacked even the freedom to sleep inside the house. The Talbots made Gobo, a primary age child, sleep in a shed. The extreme winter cold caused frostbite on his feet, giving him a permanent limp. Even after the legal end of forced servitude in 1862, Talbot sold him illegally 
to labor for the Whitesides family. The Whitesides eventually sold him again, illegally, to herd sheep in Grantsville. Outside of the thoughts in his head, when his life reality included enslavement, subject to the control of people who did not grant him respect or personal autonomy as a full human being like them, Gobofango did not have the pr privilege to worship according to his own dictates. The association between religion and race and the dynamics of majority-minority power can be seen in the thinking of Joseph Smith. In 1839, arguing for greater protection for religious minorities, Smith said even non-white foreigners, including Mohammedans, Muslims, and Hottentots, the Kokoi of southwestern Africa, should be defended. Even if, quote, their religion was false as hell, close quote, he asked, what right would men, oh, I can just say the whole quote, what right would men have to drive them from their homes and their country or to exterminate them so long as their religion did not interfere with the civil rights of men according to the laws of our country, none at all. Near the end of his life, when his thinking on majority-minority dynamics was most developed, Smith took concrete action against racism by publicly opposing the enslavement of African Americans as he ran for president. This fleshes out Smith's notion of freedom and civil rights, ideally universal privileges for all religious believers and all races, but in reality, often inaccessible to minority groups. Overall, there's clear evidence of endemic racism against indigenous peoples, blacks, and people of color within Utah history since the arrival of Latter-day Saint settlers. One obvious indicator of white supremacist ideas in Utah was the legislature's official sanction of the enslavement of black people in 1852. From 1852 to 1978, church leaders denied black Latter-day Saints, such as Jane Manning Jane's, access to religious ordinances considered essential and saving for all church members, justifying this policy with explicitly racist explanations, now officially disavowed. An anti-miscegenation law passed by a non-Latter-day Saint legislature in 1898 and upheld by subsequent Latter-day Saint legislatures until 1963 banned marriage between whites and blacks and between whites and Asians. My kids would not exist. In housing, beginning around 1939, a local Latter-day Saint bishop and realtor, Sheldon Brewster, gathered 1,000 signatures for a petition that would require all black citizens of Salt Lake City to live in a certain neighborhood far from the city center. After this petition failed, restrictive housing clauses, such as this one, were inserted into real estate contracts. The most extreme example of racism involved mob violence and lynchings. For instance, in Salt Lake City in 1883, a group of police officers, all of whom were Latter-day Saints, beat a black prisoner, Joseph Samuels, then turned him over to a mob of 2,000 who kicked and stamped on him, then hung him in a stable yard next to City Hall. Upon his death, crowds of men, women, and children gave a chorus of three cheers. Then some of them cut the corpse down and dragged it along State Street, hooting and yelling like mad. Now that we've established this broad backdrop, I'll focus on a range a range of race and religion related incidents from the history of the Chinese in Utah. I'll share two examples of Utah Latter-day Saints protecting religious freedom uh, by defending against racism and restricting religious freedom. Uh, three examples of Utah Latter-day Saint communities restricting religious freedom by upholding racism. In Utah, official church rhetoric discouraged anti-Chinese violence, the likes of which often prevailed in other Western states. The rhetoric on these uh, Chinese in these public spaces was influenced by a number of factors. One was a broad-minded emphasis on embracing learning and reaching out to all nations in the, um, you know, in the teachings of Joseph Smith. Throughout the late 19th century, the Deseret News wrote far more favorable articles about the Chinese in the region than was typical of the Chinese, um, uh, of papers covering the Chinese in the Rocky Mountains. Another was familiarity with through face-to-face -face relationships. As the city's white residents began to give up farming, farming and turn to urban uh, lifestyles. Chinese farmers used vacant city lots to grow vegetables. Local housewives appreciated the fresh, cheap produce Chinese farmers sold door to door. A tone of respect for the Chinese work ethic comes through in the Latter-day Saint leader George Q. Cannon's critique of the Nevada legislature in 1869. A bill had been introduced that would legally propose, uh, protect Chinese from mob violence. And, um, but Nevada legislatures were working to defeat it. Uh, George Q. Cannon commended the hardworking, economical sons of the flowering kingdom and argued um, what you see on the screen, which I will not read for time. Another example comes from Ogden in 1885, when the Knights of Labor, a white workers' organization, started an anti-Chinese boycott. The Knights had found anti-Chinese rhetoric to be highly effective in recruiting for their, uh, as a recruiting tool. And Western newspapers often joined the Knights in criticizing Chinese workers, building mainstream support for violent attacks. But while the uh, Latter-day Saint run Ogden Daily Herald and Deseret News expressed sympathy for white workers' frustrations and published negative editorials with the Chinese use of opium, they ultimately rejected any sort of extra-legal violence. So for example, there's a heated political rally in Ogden on August 18th. A local judge, ironically, 
Judge A. Heed said of the Chinese, why don't we pass laws and drag them up, hang them up, do anything to get rid of them? And they're not like talking about posting, hanging up the laws, they're talking about hanging up the people. Um, the Deseret News condemned the rhetoric as too extreme, though it did not contradict the premise that Chinese immigrants were undesirable. It just said, none but legal and pacific measures is more proper in divesting the country of their presence. This same emphasis on law and order is evident in the church's opposition to the Ku Klux Klan. The Deseret News published anti-Klan editorials and reports, including extracts from Latter-day Saint missionaries in the southern states describing the Klan's terrorist activities. The Klan helped this antagonistic relationship along by threatening and terrorizing Latter-day Saint missionaries uh, in, in the south. Um, in general conference in October 1922, President Heber J. Grant specifically named the Ku Klux Klan and when he condemned secret organizations that undertook to administer punishment on men and women irrespective of the laws of the land. The church mouthpiece also cautioned against flaring racial passions in the summer of 1900 when newspapers reported intensively on anti-Christian attacks on American and European missionaries in China. Uh, under the headline, Protecting the Mongolian, um, the Desert News made this caution uh, to protect the Chinese. A second way in which Latter-day Saints created space for Chinese religious freedom was through explicitly naming Chinese as the people entitled to uh, religious freedom, often alongside Latter-day Saints themselves. In 1898, the Salt Lake Herald Republican, run by Latter-day Saints, reprinted a pro-Latter-day Saint article from the Washington Post comparing the church to other non-Christian religions. And this is a long quote. Uh, you can read it, and I highlighted the parts where you see Mormonism and Joss House are in the same part. So these explicitly pro-religious freedom discourses often included mentions of the Chinese, whose religious practices Latter-day Saints saw both as alien and also familiar because of the presence of Chinese in local society. For example, did you know in the late 19th and 20th century, around Chinese New Year, there would be this flurry of articles on Chinese culture in the local newspapers. And um, during the weeks of, of the Chinese New Year being celebrated, when Chinese would typically visit each other, um, white people would also visit the Chinese. They would, just, they would be like a tour, and they would go on tours through Chinatown, and Chinese people would invite them to their homes, and they would drink tea and eat Chinese uh, sweets. Um, in 1911, the, the Utah legislature went like, as, as a group tour to um, see all these things. So, so the, the Chinese were the, the people who were kind of close at hand, the, the other that was right there, the exotic thing that you could go see every year uh, on Chinese New Year. So, um, and so you can see this. Uh, papers in Utah often reprinted excerpts from other newspapers that discussed Latter-day Saints as an exotic, peculiar religious group on par with other exotic and charismatic religious groups, including Chinese. So here, you know, um, four Utah papers um, reprinted this excerpt from a paper talking about the religious diversity in, in London and like how there's all these different groups all together. The wacko Mormons, the wacko Chinese, the wacko Sandemanians, and the followers of Joanna Southcott, the prophetic serving maid, all together. Okay, so how have... Uh, okay, so such awareness of their marginality and perceived esotericness in the eyes of others may have made it easier for Latter-day Saints to empathize with Chinese or to view the protection of Chinese religious freedom as a way to ensure their own protection. Legal statutes against interracial marriage, okay, enacted by a non-Latter-day Saint legislature in 1888 but maintained by subsequent Latter-day Saint legislatures until 1963, again, before which my children could not exist, restricted Chinese religious freedom by denying free access to a major Chinese religious duty, namely to marry and produce offspring to carry on the family line and continue ancestral rights. So in China, religion has a kind of family, it's, like a, it's literally a family religion. The religion is the family, meaning that um, children are supposed to uh, maintain spiritual ties with their parents, their ancestors, going all the way back. And if you don't produce the next generation to maintain these spiritual ties, you've like literally ruined your family's eternal life forever. I'm sure no one here has ever heard anything like that. <laughs> so why, so, um, why didn't they just marry you know, Chinese women? Um, well, they couldn't. It was very hard. So here's a, here's a picture of my family. Um, my uh, great-grandfather, Jin Gorju, came to Utah as a laborer. Uh, he worked in the mining camp in Salt Lake City. And in 1927, um, so he was an older person. He was you know, in his 20s. He was ready to marry. There was no one to marry in Utah um, because you can't marry white people and there are no Chinese women. And why aren't there Chinese women? Well, it's because the Chinese Exclusion Act and other racist laws were extremely effective at excluding uh, Chinese women from the U.S. So the, the, you, you couldn't do it. So he had to apply for a special permission to go back to China. It was a long trip, very expensive trip. Um, usually a once-in-a-lifetime trip, 
He went back to China. He um, met my great grandmother. He married her, and then he brought her back. Um, and even if you had gotten like quote unquote special permission, that wasn't ironclad. It also depended on the whims of the of the immigration officials. So you could like you know risk your whole future, your whole career, your whole livelihood by trying to go back and get yourself a wife from your same race. Uh, so their their family, a full fledged family of a husband and a wife and kids, was a huge exception to the usual kind of life that Chinese in Utah were allowed to have. I hope that this audience, which understands the religious significance of marriage and family life, can see how legal restrictions on freedom to marry equate to legal restrictions on freedom of religion. A second way in which Utah Latter-day Saints restricted Chinese American access to religious freedom was a form of legal and social restrictions on space in the community. In Salt Lake City, Chinese were mostly confined by social pressures to the cramped, poorly maintained street of Chinatown centered around Plum Alley. When they ventured outside, they were more likely to be attacked. In January 1891, a Chinese man was badly beaten and bruised by a crowd of boys as he walked the city streets. In October 1893, a young man named Charles Arnup stoned Wong Kong Kim to death in Salt Lake City at the corner of 3rd South and 9th East. Beyond violence, harassment was often leveled at Chinese outside of Chinatown in the form of arrests or fines for petty offenses to which white members of the population were rarely subjected. Just in Salt Lake City, in the month of September 1898, um, we have these incidents. Uh, Chung Chung was um, visiting someone and was arrested for being suspicious in that neighborhood. Um, uh, another policeman fined this other person for a bicycle ordinance. You had to have a bell and a light on your bicycle, but most people didn't have it, but it wasn't usually enforced, but it was for him. Um, and then a, a snipe violation, which was not enforced for, for anyone else in the 1890s. Um, actually, the third way in which Latter-day Saints in Utah constrained the religious opportunities of the Chinese was through racist denig... Oh, sorry, I missed something. Um, Oh yeah, okay, they, um, there are also the circulation of these restrictive covenants on who could own property. So for example, when Shiko Okazaki um, moved to Utah, was a you know, valued member of her ward in Salt Lake City, she, they tried to buy a lot for a house within the ward boundaries, but they were initially barred by these racial covenants. Chinese, other Asians, and blacks were thus barred from purchasing property to erect places of worship, a basic element of religious freedom, or to live in religious communities of their choice. Even within Chinatown, religious property was not secure. On at least one occasion in 1903, groups of young white men entered Chinatown and vandalized Chinese residences, business, and the Chinese temple. And here's this report. And if you look at the report, you'll see this kind of tone of levity. They like walk in and they vandalize the, the Joss house and play havoc with the contents and uh, emit, tore up the image. So um, the third way in which, which Latter-day Saints in Utah constrained the religious opportunities of the Chinese was through racist denigrations of Chinese religion and popular media. This is certainly the least egregious of all the expressions of racism discussed in this paper. But it is perhaps most significant because it shows the extent to which racist ideas and assumptions were part of Utah popular culture. To the extent that racist media ridiculed or downgraded Chinese sacred symbols and religious culture within society, they eroded the space for the sacred that full religious freedom would have allowed. Now, of course, over the course of history, um, devout believers have been able to carry on despite popular ridicule and non-believer sacrilege. And now that I think about it, I'm probably guilty of like some sacrilege myself. Um, religious freedom does not include the right to popularity. However, the privilege of religious freedom as defined in the 12th article of faith implies parity in terms of the dignity accorded to human conscience and religious worship. The erosion of the dignity of a religious believer or symbol via racist depictions in public media makes it more likely that members of the public will cease to ascribe dignity to those actual, real-life human believers and their privileges of conscience and religious devotion. This desecratory speech can be found in negative depictions of Chinese and religious uh, and cultural celebrations, and also, um, for example, like this one, uh, saying, say, talking about the slant-eyed worshippers of Confucius, saying they're happier and happier, the thicker the fumes and the more foul-smelling they become. Desecratory speech is expressed in the ways in which people use terms for Chinese religions, such as Joss House, Idol, and Altar, in ways that carried a negative or derogatory meaning. For example, the Logan Journal, praising a political orator, who is a woman, uh, cool for her, said that Mrs. Laura DeForest Gordon, quote, wastes no time in preliminaries but plunges at once into her subject and smashes the idols of protection and centralization in the Joss House of Republicanism. A similar tactic, this time focused on the Democrats, um, was at work in the Ogden Daily Standard in September 1998, uh, talking about, you know, now that these, the Democrats are worshiping at the Joss House, uh, where they gave homage to their idol, Grover Cleveland, and burned these very smelly punk, tricks, punk sticks, incense. 
Now, of course, religious images have long worked their way into popular discourse as descriptive shortcuts. I'm not trying to police all language, but what's striking is in the new Utah newspapers describing a white person as a participant in Chinese religion amounts to an ad hominem smear attack, a way of downgrading that person in the public eye. Desecratory speech can also be found in the way in which Chinese culture became a meme or a cultural trope signaling something funny or laughable. An ad in the Ogden Evening Standard in July 1912 depicted a white tailor cutting off the queue of an unwilling Chinese person. And, and I should say that hair was considered in Chinese culture a sacred gift from one's parents. So it was actually had religious significance. Not to mention the fact that people should not touch other people's hair um, or their heads for that matter. Um, Racist depictions of Chinese were a powerful advertising tool. But again, such a public and crass deployment of racial denigration detracted from respect for Chinese in the community, thereby detracting from the public dignity and prestige of their religious practice. A similar example of both the attraction of exotic culture and freedom local Utahns felt appropriating sacred symbols for commercial purposes is the Might and Joss House. Um, I was like looking in the newspapers and it said there was like a fire at the Might and Joss House and I, and I was like, oh no, they like lit a fire at the temple in Mighton, but then I, it's actually um, like a, a, a diner or like a place where you go for soda. Um, but it was named the Mighton Joss House. Very memorable. Um, but again, appropriating these sacred symbols. So these examples of desecratory pu public speech and image making are not as horrifying as the examples of physical violence I shared early. But they are just as, or perhaps even more weighty, because of the way these negative associations of Chinese and Chinese religion had become common sense in Utah popular culture, not just in the attitudes and actions of a few violent thugs, but in the everyday lives of people engaging in political discussions or ordering sodas. These negative depictions of Chinese sacred symbols gave racism in the community a pet potential eternal life, always circulating, renewing, reappearing in a way that reinforced white superiority and normativity versus Chinese inferiority and alterity by degrading or making ridiculous those things which Chinese held most sacred most reverent, most worthy of dignity, these racist ideas contributed to a Utah culture that dehumanized non-whites. In this context of non-white dehumanization, we can see how a crowd of 2,000 mostly Latter-day Saint men, women, and children in Salt Lake was expressing their community values as they cheered, as they savagely murdered a black man outside City Hall and dragged his corpse down State Street. I think it's obvious to everyone that racism, um, limiting religious freedom, applies not only to Chinese, but to other minority groups, including blacks, indigenous people, and other people of color who have long called Utah home. Pushed off their rich and expansive lands, Native Americans were no longer able to sustain their traditional way of life, including their traditional religious practices. In sum, a society that truly values and advances religious freedom is a society that truly values and advances the work of abandoning attitudes and actions of prejudice. Conversely, to paraphrase John, um, 1 John 4.20, if anyone, anyone says, I love religious freedom, but hates anti-racism, they are living in a state of hypocrisy. For whoever does not care to protect fellow humans' universal dignity and full access to all opportunities within society, so long as they don't limit the opportunities of others, cannot truly value the privilege of all people to worship how, where, or what they may. Thanks. I think that we've had uh, two excellent presentations, and so we'd like to open up the time now for questions. I have, so, so I have a question about the Cook Islands now. You listed six churches, I think it was six, that are using government support. So two questions. One, does that include money, like financial support from the government? And are there any churches not included on that list of six? So, so, so are there some that are still not receiving the same equal treatment? No, there's such great Okay, I've got about four hands, so I'm going to go here, here, and then right over here, third, and then fourth at the back here. Okay? I'll put them. Thank you. Um, thanks again for both your presentations. They're both really, really fascinating. Um, I was wondering, when, in terms of uh, 
kind of this anti-Chinese discrimination and some kind of violence in Utah. How much do, I was actually a little, I was almost surprised to see sort of Chinese traditions being treated as religions because I, think, I feel like in the present, so often they get lumped with philosophy or, or like, oh, Confucianism is not really a religion. Like, to what extent were they consistently treated as religions and to what extent was this helpful for, to what, uh, I'm not, I feel like I'm not phrasing this well actually, sorry, but uh, how consistent were religious conceptions of Chinese tradition and how, cons or compared to sort of the de-religiousization of these values? Very close the Yes, please. So um, that's a great question, and um, I think you're right that there's this, this kind of inherent um, like power dynamic and like whether you classify someone's experiences as as religious or not religious because um, they have like a prestige or they don't have a prestige they have protection they don't have protection. Um, so I, I would say that um, that the newspapers really did um, sometimes write these very long detailed articles explaining the Chinese attitude towards religion is very different from our attitude towards religion. We think about denominations and churches, but they you know draw on these three major religious traditions and they kind of mix and match. So so actually there is a lot of pretty sophisticated discourse in in like the Deseret News or sometimes the Improvement Era, era speaking about these um, Chinese customs. And as I said, every time um, every time a China person a Chinese person died, um, there was usually like um, like a, f a famous Chinese person died in the, in the community, there was like a big religious procession and then there'd be all these articles about like, Chinese burial customs and you know, because people are just fascinated, like what? You, you let the corpse, corpse decompose for eight months and then you dig up the bones, you clean them off and you ship them back to China. Like that was very fascinating to people. And they, they're always talking about that. So, so they, they did talk about that as a, as a religious practice. Um, at other times though, it was clear that um, they thought they were, they didn't afford these practices the same um, dignity that, that they saw their own religious practices. Like there was an article that said, you know, Chinese believe in fairy stories. They like believe these supernatural stories of things that could never happen in real life with like no sense of irony about like gold plates, virgin birth, anything like that. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm just wondering where you see us today with respect to uh, Chinese and uh, other people. What's your personal experience? What's the personal experience that you're, you have had and are having with your own family, your own children? Oh, that, that's a very kind question. I'll just be really short since I don't want to talk too much about myself here. But um, uh, uh, <laughs> my, um, when my kids came to, to Utah from Auckland, they were, they were stunned. Because, and they came home and they said, Mom, there's only like one kind of person here. Um, which, which means that people sometimes without intending to be unkind, like will say things that like make it clear that they're like, whoa, you're so weird. Like they'll be like, oh, your English is so good. You know, like we, I didn't expect you to be able to speak English or, um, or, or the, uh, they'll say, like, oh yeah, so I assume you're from Japan. And I'll say, no, I'm actually from Orange County, the end of Disneyland. So, so just things like that. I just think that people... Um, just because of the, the homogeneity in their everyday life, people aren't as used to like assuming that someone who's who's not white is like local and belongs here. But um, in terms of like outright religious bigotry, um, my kids do have to um, ride down a for a while. Um, they did have to ride down a bike path with a swastika painted on it just recently during the pandemic. So I'm afraid that we still have a lot of these issues um, here. But now we have a prophetic charge, which we can all work on. Thank you. Thank you so much for this great uh, panel. Um, I wanted to pick up, if I could, Melissa, on the first third or so of your um, of your presentation, where you talked about Gobo Fango, um, the 1852 um, legalization of slavery, um, uh, and and try to connect that, and I'm not sure this is very well connected in my own mind, but one of the things that we saw in the Reynolds opinion in 1879 was the comparison of the Latter-day Saints to people from Asia and Africa. So sort of picking up directly on this kind of um, overlap. Um, and so one of the things that's most interesting um, to me is to see how those people who were compared to people from Asia and Africa treated people from Asia and Africa. Um, uh, and, and so um, 
I'm, I'm interested in thinking about, so one of the, the key aspects of the 1852 law on slavery was a, a, a sense of gradual emancipation. In other words, not sort of the most brutal, obviously Gogo -Go Fango was subjected to terrible things, but not the most aggressive form of slavery. Um, uh, and, and so instead of enslaving native children, they were purchased and adopted, still made to work and very dangerous stuff. But, but this sort of, the way that, I'm done, yeah, sorry. But I, I want to, if I could, explore the ways you see this being a softer form, um, even violent or not. And I'm just very interested in that. Um, I think that's a great point, and, and I think we could say, like, like the example of the Latter-day Saint um, of just you know responses to mob violence, right. it does show a softer form. When you have this kind of universalist doctrine, and you're sending missionaries trying to get into China, they, they don't succeed. Um, China, India, um, and you know to places where there are brown people, then I, I think that does have a kind of uh, softening. You, you can't be completely racist. Even, even people, you know, even Brigham Young said, you know, um, black people will have the priesthood someday. Like, they're entitled to all the blessings, just not now. So, so I, I do see it as, as softer. Um, on the other hand, we all know from like, um, like when you're at school and there's like the cool kids and you're like one of the unpopular kids and then one of the other unpopular kids like tries to be your friend and you're like, no, <laughs> no, don't, don't hang out with me. It makes me look bad. So you can kind of see, you know, other historians like Paul Reeve and um, Tom Alexander have talked about that moment kind of in Mormonism where um, there's this kind of, in, in attempting to kind of, uh, ex you know, get away from these, um, what they saw as defamatory associations with, with brown people. Um, they, they, they kind of turned up their own exclusion and, and racism and, and separation. So I think both of those are going on. I think we have time for one more question. Thanks. Um, you talked a couple of times about a lynching that I infer from context is a pretty well-known event in Utah history. This is my first time visiting Utah, um, so for maybe just anyone watching online who's not familiar with Utah history, I was just wondering if you could talk a bit more about what the context and the circumstances were of that lynching. I don't think it's pretty well known. I mean, there were several lynchings in Utah, but um, I, I learned about it myself in the process of researching the paper. So um, the, the person um, who, who was lynched was uh, referred to by different names. Um, some people called him Samuel Joe Harvey. Other people called him Joseph Williams. Um, the person after, after the, his death, um, someone claiming to be his half-brother said it was Joseph Williams, not the name that people had been using for him in the papers. But um, at any rate, there was a, it was a black man. He was, um, he was asking for uh, work from a proprietor, of, a black proprietor of a store. And there was a kind of altercation. Um, he got mad. Um, the cops were called. Uh, Officer Burt, who Marshall Burt, a respected Latter-day Saint, and um, and Mar Lawman, um, uh, came in, uh, confronted him. Um, he said, "Are you a cop?" The guy says, "I am." Um, he shot him, uh, and the cop fell over and, and lay on the ground. And then um, he ran, and he was caught by other um, policemen, who then, um, who then. Um, uh, it took him in the cell, and they said, you know, if you have killed Marshall Burt, you will die for this. And then um, it was, they found out that Marshall Burt had died, and then the policemen um, ran on him with sticks and knives and whatever. So they beat him, they stamped on him, and they took him out, and they turned him over to a lynch mob that had gathered outside, and then they, they lynched him. Yeah. So then the rest was in the paper. But I hadn't heard this before either. Well, our time is up for questions. We'd like to thank uh, our panelists. Can we give them one big more, a big hand? Thank you.